I just want to say uh, how delighted I am, certainly that all of you are here, uh, but that we're able to meet uh, in the Peggy Notabart Museum. I can just see a show of hands. For how many of you is this your first time here? Yeah, it's kind of a hidden gem, I mean, compared to Chicago's other museums. So if you are local, I'd strongly encourage you to, to come back uh, during the summer. But it's also really something, uh, kind of the realization of a, a dream for me. So I'm the rector out at Mundelein Seminary. And increasingly, you know, my hope or my vision for the seminary is that we might be able to position ourselves as a center in the archdiocese for talking about especially some of these questions around faith and science, because I think uh, it's no exaggeration to say that if there's one area that a lot of people maybe have questions or even struggle with their faith, uh, surveys certainly show that one of the main reasons people leave the faith is because they think there's an inherent incompatibility between you know, scientific discoveries, things that science explores, results that scientific investigations obtain and basic tenets of the faith. However, you're only really going to be able to get some sort of satisfactory dialogue around that if you roll up your sleeves and you dig in. You know, you can't just have kind of a facile surface conversation and really hope to get any satisfaction. So that's why nights like tonight, but also we host a number of other things during the course of the year. Um, are just a wonderful opportunity. So when we get to the Q&A, you know, everything is fair game. So don't hesitate to bring it up. My refusing to answer is fair game too, but <laughs> it's okay. Um, and also a huge uh, note of thanks to IT folks from Mundelein and the folks here at Peggy Notabart. There's always unexpected glitches and they have everything working great. So the, uh, the title there, God saw that it was good and the scientists agreed, faith meets science in the natural world. Um, just that sense of when a scientist goes out and looks at the world, whether it's the natural world or it's you know, biology or chemistry or physics, there's always going to be just an inherent fascination. Um, I should say a little of my background, I was trained in astrophysics and still is a, a real passion of mine. And a lot of times, you know, people will sort of politely say, science has its domain, faith has its domain, and they're not necessarily in conflict with each other, but they're also not necessarily actively engaged with each other. And that is the thing, if nothing else, you leave with tonight. You know, maybe uh, you have a good time, you enjoy the beautiful sight, uh, you may have a stuffed butterfly or something in your purse. But if nothing else, I hope you leave with the serious, serious conviction that faith and science are not meant to simply politely tolerate the existence of the other, okay? They're certainly not meant to be at war with each other, but they are meant to be engaged. Because a good scientist would never say about any part of the world, you know, I'm not interested in that, or that's off limits to science, or, you know, science doesn't explore those things. A scientist is fascinated by everything that is. And if God exists, then that's something that is and is worthwhile exploring. And even a scientist who doesn't believe in God should be fascinated by people who are, should be fascinated by why religion is such a central part of the world we inhabit today. And similarly, a theologian should be fascinated by everything, right? If you know any good theologians, I challenge you, you know, to put the question to them, what part of the universe you know, is off limits to you? If you really believe that theology is what we say it is, then every part of the created universe is something you would want to engage or learn about. And so I always contend that science and theology, maybe more than any other two disciplines or interests, very much live in one another's world. There are distinctions to be sure, but I think a lot of times we begin with the differences and never work our way around to the intimate connection. So the next little clip I'm gonna show you, I'm gonna give you zero lead in and assume I hadn't even just said what I had said for a few minutes. You're gonna see a group of folks coming into a room much like this and they're told nothing. They're given a card. <laughs> 
It's red on one side and blue on the other. So imagine you came in tonight and that's all you had. You didn't even know the title of this talk, right? You just, um, just wandered in aimlessly, which some of you may have. They have no idea what they're supposed to do with these cards. <laughs> so pay attention to how they're reasoning through what this is all about. Good evening, everyone. I hope you enjoyed our little activity that we prepared for you. So I want you to think a little bit about the question that we have on the screen. So who was playing the game? So you think you were playing the game? So you, you were involved in the game, that's sure. But who was actually controlling the game? Who was making the pedals on the screen move? OK, so think about this. But before we, we dive into this more philosophical question, 
uh, <laughs> let me just lay down to you which were the rules of the game. So the rules of the game were very simple. We basically had two rules. The audience was divided in two, and the left side of the audience controlled the left pedal, and the right side of the audience controlled the right pedal. That's rule number one. And then rule number two, what determined the position of the pedal vertically on the screen was the ratio of the blue and red cards being shown. So if you wanted to place the pedal on top of the screen, all of you had, had to be showing the, the red card. And if you wanted to place the pedal on bottom, all of you had to be showing the blue card. Now, if you wanted to, to place the pedal in the middle of the screen, you had to divide yourselves equally between the number of blue and red, pedal, and red cards. So, so that's the rules of the games. And how did you play this? So basically, each of you had a decision. Should I put the blue or the red? So maybe in the beginning, this was a random decision. After a while, you started realizing what the people around you were doing and how this affected the mechanics of the game. So basically, in this case, if you're controlling the right pedal, you want to move the right pedal down. So you want to place a blue card. So you do this, and uh, you actually manage to, to play the game. Um, what happened is that um, none of you individually was controlling, but it was this global consensus that each half of the audience, that it emerged from each half of the audience that controlled the pedal. And in, more importantly, there was, although there were some people shouting uh, which was the card that you should place, uh, each of you individually made that decision based on the information that you had. So let's get back to the million dollar question of who uh, was actually controlling the game. And what controlled the game was the pattern of blue and red that you all formed. Now at this point you have every right to say, hey, I came here to hear about nature. Okay? <laughs> I want to see some melting glaciers. You may be introduced to some things tonight that you weren't expecting to be introduced to, but there's a reason for that. Um, a lot of times in the faith science dialogue, we're not always so familiar with the science. I'm sure we have some ringers here who know 10 times more about this than I do. But I find that to really benefit from the dialogue, it's helpful to spend a little more time than is often done with the science. And so even though no glaciers were harmed in making tonight's PowerPoint, the reason we looked at this, and we're going to look at one other clip, right? not just because I'm lazy, but that'll be it. It just, you know, sometimes a clip gets across a lot of words is that this is an example of really a fairly recent branch of science known as complexity theory. And it's applicable in a huge range of areas. Um, any of you who fought the traffic to get here tonight, uh, <laughs> folks who do traffic engineering make use of it. Airlines make use of it in terms of trying to come up with you know, hub and spoke models. But the point is, the idea behind complexity theory is that you have a huge number of interacting agents. Okay? In this case, each person with their red or blue card. Collectively, they make decisions. Collectively, there are large-scale patterns and movements that happen. But there's no way in the world that everybody could be tuned in to everybody else. And you saw that you know, very graphically in that little clip. Slowly, however, the various players begin to realize they have something to do with what's going on, and then they have to sort of reason out. Without having the ability to talk to everybody else in the room or ask someone, how does this work? As you saw through trial and error, uh, and it's kind of a Rorschach personality test, right? You could tell who the type A were, and a bunch of, red, stupid, red, what's the matter with you? I'm sure marriage has ended you know, by the end of this game. <laughs> Children were disowned and all the rest of it. Um, but that, at the core, is really uh, a big part of environmental science or talking about ecology. Because it's that branch of science, really all science, something like this is applicable to, but let's say you're working in quantum physics, in incredibly small, small scales. You don't really have a sense, as a human being, on the scale of a person, what's going on there. And let's say you study astronomy, okay? You're looking at enormously large scales. You don't really have a direct feel as a human being for those kinds of sizes. When you talk about the environment or ecology, most of the time you're talking about a very familiar, comfortable range, right? It's, it's us sitting in this room. It's us looking at the trees outside. So 
in a less artificial example of looking at these cards and the players, let's just look at one more clip at some of the examples of what have been known about for a long time in the natural world, but only recently are people starting to ask themselves the question, is there some methodology here? You know, is there a way that as scientists we might try to piece together what's going on? Because you see some incredible behaviors. You have thousands of birds all behaving as if they've synchronized themselves, when in point of fact there's no way in the world the birds are communicating with one another. And what we know from studying birds is that the large-scale behavior is governed by some very small decisions that are just made locally. So birds are just doing what birds do in terms of flying relative to their nearest neighbor, and somehow you're getting this seemingly very choreographed behavior. So what I'm going to call a complex system then is characterized by a number of factors, but these would certainly be some of the most important that you have agents. Let's go back to the clip we all saw, the folks in the room. You know, each person is an agent, obviously. If you have a system, you have independently thinking, acting beings. Um, those could be animals in the wild. Those could be, you know, plants. Some mean of means of interaction. The folks in the room with their cards, um, however primitive it was, they could sort of communicate to the others. You know, red, red, blue, blue. Um, and they pretty quickly discerned that they were governing one half uh, of what was going on in the screen. So there has to be some way that the different agents can communicate. There has to be feedback. Feedback simply means you have some sense of how you're doing. You know, you can see the paddle move, right? Uh, for any Gen Xers here, your heart was warmed by that game of Pong, right? So <laughs> millennials, you don't know what you missed. Nor should you care, you didn't miss much. Um, so, but this idea of you have to have a sense of how am I, is it working, is it not working? If you see a flock of birds that are moving around, you know, a bird knows if it's missed the flock, if somehow it's gotten far away and it probably gets eaten or something. So there's evolutionary uh, implications here as well. But you need to have some sense of whether the system you are a part of is behaving in a way that you hope it will. And the last thing that's often important in these complex system models is that there needs to be a limited resource. Um, in the case of the, uh, the cards, right, the blue and the red cards, well, the limited resource is the cards themselves. Um, there's also a limited resource in the sense that the paddle is only so large, right? They can't just sit there like slugs and have the little ball be accurately hit by the paddle. Um, the size of the paddle is a limit to the resource that you have. Now that may sound pretty abstract, but uh, let's say you have a flock of birds again or schooling fish. A lot of times those are characteristics that are used to uh, gather prey. So that's a limited resource. So the point is, it's not like you can do anything anytime and there's no consequences there is a driving motivation or incentivization. And then what you find is something called emergence. And that little clip we saw with the cards, uh, priests are supposed to know how to position these, but <laughs> I just supposedly teach guys how to be priests. I don't actually have to act like one. So, <laughs> but emergence means that over time, what you start to see is some sort of organized pattern. In the case of the folks with the cards, what emerges is they actually can move that paddle, okay? And the game, you know they would get better and better at it as time went by. Probably, eventually, it would look like one person just turning the control instead of half a room. So it's this idea that out of seemingly little localized actions, what can emerge is a very large scale fairly impressive behavior. Okay, ecology, now we're here. Interesting word, right? I'm sure we have some word geeks here. Fairly recently coined, ecology, right? A, a German word from the 19th century. Uh, but to understand the word, you have to like yogurt, okay? Because <laughs> we all know ecologists eat, they don't, I mean, oikos is like the, the Snickers bar of health food, you know. If you're, if, if you're a real ecologist, you, 
You milk a cow, you shake it up, and that's your yogurt. So you need to know about yogurt, and you need to know about books or study. Because the word comes from oikos logio. Okay? Oikos, and it's kind of funny, I mean, if people realize what, what the word means, the yogurt people. It, it means house or household. Um, it's where we get the word economy from, oikos, nomos, the law of the household. So if you think of that class nobody takes anymore, home economics, that's not just how to balance your checkbook. It's the ordering, the well ordering of the household. And logos, obviously, a study of. So ecology is the study of the household, you know, of nature, of the world. And I really like that, you know, when, when that word was coined, it was very appropriately done. If you study ecology, whether it's a small scale or it's, you know, the planet itself, you're not just looking at random objects that you're, you know, putting under your microscope or whatever. You're interested in the overall ordering, the overall, you know, mechanism. No one piece in isolation. And of course, in any given experiment, you may highlight a particular thing. But if you're an ecologist or an environmentalist, you want to know how it all fits together. Just like if you're watching the, the folks in the room, you're not just fixating on one person with their card. So the idea then that, you know, it's the study of the home or the household, if you keep that in mind. Uh, and hence, uh, that's way down. What it says is care for our common home. Those of you familiar with Pope Francis's uh, encyclical Laudato Si, the subtitle of, or the sub, yeah, the subtitle of that is care for our common home and it's very well chosen. You know, common home isn't just sort of a nice fuzzy phrase for the planet. Uh, it really is our household. Okay, so here's an example, you know, of an ecosystem. You might have seen something like this in your grade school or high school, you know, textbook. But it's just a good illustration of the fact that, you know, an ecosystem has lots and lots of parts, obviously. You have those parts that are unique to people. So things like, you know, factories that we make, uh, cars that we drive, all those sorts of things. You have natural phenomena, there, there's a volcano, interesting landscape here. Uh, you have the sea, the ocean, you know, you have a lot of energy, most of the energy coming from sunlight, um, composition, gas composition in the clouds. So, I mean, you get the idea. But the point is, if you really want to talk about ecology, you don't have the freedom to ignore any of those. You can't simply say, well, you know, I'm a non-cloud ecologist, or you know, my colleague down the hall worries about the sun. I, that's not my thing. Of course, in our specialized world, people are going to focus on certain elements, but woe to the scientist who loses sight of the big picture. That's certainly true of astronomers. It's definitely true of biologists. Um, and I just, again, as I said, because this scale is the scale we all live on, right? We don't have microscope eyes or telescope eyes. This is the stuff we see all the time. And so we can, I think, appreciate the importance of not losing sight of some of the major players or elements. But this is a complex system, right? Complexity theory very definitely applies to this. Well, what's a naive model for you know, what we just saw? Well, a naive model would be something like Carbon, that's where most of our energy comes from, whether it's oil or coal or, you know, uh, even animals that we eat, a lot of carbon in them. But the, the naive assumption would be there's basically an infinite supply of that. You know, you're never going to run out of fuel you dig out of the ground. You're never going to run out of animals to eat. There's always enough there, so an infinite source. Then we're in here somewhere, we consume that, and we produce waste, you know, whatever that looks like. Lots of examples there. And that it's an infinite, you know, an infinite reservoir where we put our waste, okay? Um, no matter what it is, whether it's used up fuel that we've burned, whether it's used up food that we no longer have any use for, you can figure that out. Um, but it's an infinite, we have an infinite source, and when we're done with it, there's an infinite sink to which we can put it, okay? But that's a very naive model. It's obviously the model you come up with if you're not interested in the whole picture, right? This is the model you come up with if it's just, hey, I got mine, and when I'm done with it, I'm going to send it away, and I'll let somebody else worry about it. 
I'm not going to get into a lot of the ethics tonight, okay? Not because that isn't important. It's hugely important. But I want to let the science and the theology drive the ethics, okay? Because most people who imagine they have an infinite source of fuel and imagine that there's an infinite dump somewhere where they can put everything generally aren't trying to be unethical people. They're generally not trying to destroy as much of the environment as they possibly can. What they're being is naively ignorant of the ecosystem of which they are a part. That's a scientific problem before it's an ethical problem. So unlimited boundaries. I'm going to talk a lot about boundaries and limits tonight. And no feedback process. Notice that? Unlimited boundaries. I have an infinite source and I have an infinite sink. And there's basically no feedback at all. If I burn this stuff and it creates, you know, smoke or pollution, it just goes off and does its own thing. I don't have to worry about it. One of the biggest mistakes any scientist can make is to ignore bound, what are known as boundaries. I'm sure we have some engineers here. You know, boundary value problems are one of the most important things you have to consider. There's no such thing as a system that just exists all by itself out there in the universe. Every system is contained by some sort of boundary. Think about us in this room, right? Obviously, there's, there's glass, there's metal, there's carpet. But if we, you know, gazed outside there, and what a beautiful view, you know, bounded by the lake eventually, and if you cross the lake by whatever insignificant Big Ten states you'd find over there, but <laughs> here we are. So there's boundaries all the time. Ultimately, the atmosphere above us, the earth beneath us, but there's the dirt, and then you go down, there's the bedrock, keep going, you know, there's the molten core. But all of that affects what is within the boundary that's being contained. So, great example. Here's our Gold Coast, right? What's going on in a body of water, any place in the water, is a function of the boundary around that water. So, it's no, it is true to say that a little ripple, you know, off of Burnham Harbor or wherever, the size and the shape of that ripple in the water is a function of the shape of the shoreline, not just along Chicago, but you know, Wisconsin, Michigan, Indiana. Now, infinitesimally small influence, I'll grant you that. I mean, what's going on just offshore is gonna be a lot more important than what's going on offshore in Wisconsin. But mathematically, all of the boundary has an influence there. Where you can see this very directly is, you know, most people probably take showers, but you know, pamper yourself, take a bath, and the shape of your bathtub is going to affect how the water splashes around when you're running a bath. Um, if you want to know your neighbor better, say, can I borrow your bathtub tonight? And they probably have a different shape. And then you can actually pay attention to the fact, or use your sink, which has a different boundary shape, and the boundary affects what goes on inside. Well, boundaries are the kinds of things we're talking about here the source of my fuel, where my used fuel goes. And if I fool myself into thinking those are infinite or there's basically no boundary, then I'm a very bad scientist. And that is the beginning of being a very you know, bad citizen of the world. A much more realistic model you know, would be something like this. I have a finite source of energy. Society takes that energy, it produces waste. And then it doesn't just go into this magical garbage dump somewhere. Some of it goes into the atmosphere. From the atmosphere, some of it eventually filters down to the surface of the ocean, and from there, some of it makes its way down to the bottom of the ocean. But each one of these are sinks, quote unquote, receivers of the carbon dioxide, and they don't receive it at the same rate, okay? These rates vary. Um, we know that as human beings have been more active since the Industrial Revolution, we're putting a lot more carbon dioxide into the environment. So unlike the infinite sink that just re receives the stuff as we produce it, we know in fact that where our, in this case, carbon dioxide goes, it's a function of how much we're putting in. So simple feedback loop. Climate ecosystem, you know, how we adapt to that, and then ultimately how does that affect society? We see that today, uh, issues around global warming, obviously rising sea levels, um, polar bears, right, being really ravaged. And you don't even have to get into what's causing it, right? That's a whole other question. But undeniably, the changes are there. 
And as those changes are made, human and animal and plant populations are going to have to adjust. Again, this is a fairly simplistic view. If you wanted to start filling out, you know, you get something like this. Um, the impact on society, well, it has to do with the soil most moisture, groundwater, vegetation dynamics, precipitation, atmospheric circulation, radiative forcing, albedo, yeah, all that. You could almost never exhaust the number of agents that are acting in a complex system as complex as, never mind the whole globe, let's just take, you know, Lincoln Park um, or wherever you happen to live. And if you don't take these things into effect, you're always going to be, you know, have a less than ideal conclusions that you're drawing. So boundaries and connections. Use a fancy word, hermeneutic, just means interpretational lens, okay? What is the interpretational lens for ecological studies? And I'd like to suggest that there may be many, but this is my contender. Any complex system is governed by its boundaries or its limits and the nature of the relationship among the agents in the system, okay? Well, that's riveting. Any complex system <laughs> is governed by its boundaries, its limits, okay? You show me a system. I don't care what it is that you're interested in studying. It's people in a lecture hall, it's fish in the sea, it's a population that's you know, struggling, finding adequate food resources. What is bounding that system or what are the limitations to that system? And then how are the different agents relating? If it is a population trying to adequately feed itself, well boy, talk about a limited resource. Now the way those agents relate to one another is very significant. Do they cooperate? Is there violence? Who are the stronger? Who are the weaker? But when you put these two together, you have the lens through which you can talk about any sort of eco ecological or environmental system. So let's just look at some data, okay? We've been talking about systems, obviously things like global warming is in the news all the time. If you wanna do science, you always have to use data. You have to be looking at something. You can't just sit in your armchair and decide that horrible things are happening in the world or you've reasoned out the way a cell works because you've thought really hard about one. If you wanna do science, you have to go out, collect information, and then poke it, prod it, try to understand it. So while there is for some people a lot of debate over what is causing global warming, the fact that there is warming of the atmosphere is not disputable, at least to anybody who you know, can reasonably look at a data set. So what you're looking at here, and I realize it's too small to read the numbers, but this is basically a timeline before the present day. So, excuse me, this, this one is more recent. This is from 1800 to about the year 2050 or so. 50, 2010. Yes, it predicts the future. That's how you get grants, by the way, for, for any graduate students here. You draw a graph that predicts the future. Um, so this is temperature, okay? Uh, Technically, it's temperature anomaly, but it's basically temperature. And from 1800 to, you know, 2010, this is the behavior that you see. And the reason I always like to show this graph rather than just some dramatic, you know, arrow shooting off into the stratosphere is to very honestly acknowledge that there are fluctuations, you know. To say that we're seeing global warming on large scales doesn't mean we have to deny that here in Chicago, we've had a really lousy spring. You know, I, I think it's the second coldest on record or something like that. Um, as you can see here, there's all kinds of fluctuations in the temperature over time. Um, does anyone know what the, what one of the biggest cycles that drives the weather? Because I mean, as you can see, there's a fairly regular up down. Anybody? What? El Nino. El Nino is certainly a factor of this. It's just the sunspot cycle. Um, so our sun pretty actively, you know, turns on and turns off in terms of the, the thermostat, so to speak. Um, and that is a big weather impact. But clearly, whoops, over time, there is a marked increase. Now, you can always say that's only, a, you know, a 200-year, you know, database, more or less. And then we know as we look back over time, you look, think of the Ice Age, right? There's been increases and decreases in temperature. But definitely there is a sharp rise over the last, you know, um, 
uh, in this case, you, this is 1980, so from 1980 to 2000. Now you start asking yourself the question, well, what might be causing that? So the next graph I'm going to show you is global carbon dioxide data. Um, this is a graph that's uh, been around a lot. Maybe you've seen it. Uh, NASA put it out. It's the compilation of uh, lots of different studies. But here the time scale is really considerably larger. Uh, down here is in thousands of years, so, and zero is more or less today. So this is tracking from 400,000 years ago up to the present day. And these are global carbon dioxide readings, okay? And so what you see on a, again, any scientist would love to see, I think a the theologian as well. There's a fascinating, you know, periodicity there. But from 400,000 years ago to, you know, really quite recently, it's a pretty steady pattern. From 1950 on, it's doing this, okay? So I don't care you know, how much of a global warming denier you are, at least in terms of just looking at raw data, it's very clear that there's a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere over the last 50, certainly 100 years than we've seen, you know, going back over a scale that spans several ice ages. Um, now, you know, you start asking some obvious questions, well, where's that coming from? And I don't want to get into tonight, again, the whole debate over what's causing it, what isn't causing it. We do know, unmistakably, we've been producing and releasing a lot more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, you know, as a population, certainly since the time of the Industrial Revolution. Um, but what we do know about that carbon dioxide, it's a greenhouse gas, and so probably some is familiar to many people here. What that basically means is, you know, high energy radiation comes from the sun to the surface of the earth, it heats up the earth. The earth then radiates infrared radiation. Um, in Chicago, that usually happens about July, right? Because especially along the lake. Um, any suburbanites here, it is cooler by the lake. Uh, and so you get that infrared radiation from the earth, it goes up, and the point is these greenhouse gases absorb that infrared radiation and they hold on to it. So it's like a blanket over you on a cold night. And then that gas itself heats up and then it re-radiates back down to Earth. And what happens is you basically get an overall rising of the atmosphere because high energy radiation is allowed to penetrate, come in, it heats up the Earth, it gets re-radiated as lower energy, uh, infrared radiation mostly, and then that cannot escape back out into space. A lot more complicated than just that, but that's the basic idea. So it makes a lot of sense to imagine or hypothesize that there's a correlation between the dramatic rise in carbon dioxide, for example, you could look at other greenhouse gases, and the significant rise in temperature. Okay, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, um, which is by no means a, uh, a fringe organization. By and large, these are pretty conservative folks before they make any blanket statements. But as long ago as 2006, they made the statement, uh, this was a very public uh, statement they made in Science Magazine, the scientific evidence is clear, global climate change caused by human activities is occurring now. They go on and cite some examples, and then they say at the end, the time to control greenhouse gas emissions is now. So again, without wading into that, that would be a whole other, you know, a book, many books about, well, what exactly is causing it? And, I simply cannot, you know, I, I couldn't get a good night's sleep, though, if I somehow said, well, there's still a lot of debate over whether or not, you know, global temperatures are rising. Um, that's simply absurd. And it would also be foolish to say there's a lot of debate over whether or not there's more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. That would be absurd. Again, a good scientist always begins with, tell me objectively what you know. Now, what we do with that, you know, is a hugely important question. But the objective facts are pretty well determined. So why do we do it? Okay, not why do we climb Mount Everest, we know the answer to that. Why do we produce at times a world around us that doesn't look like this? You know, just walking over here uh, from the L, you know, you see some, right? Garbage in the street, you don't have to look far. 
It's a pristine, beautiful lakefront, but if we went down there at eye level, we'd soon find garbage and, and all kinds of ugly stuff. But I don't believe for a minute that the reason we screw up this beauty is because somebody woke up one day and said, you know, that just isn't doing it for me. I'd much rather have this, okay? It's not the choice, I believe, of anyone. And I don't care how cold-hearted, you know, uh, you could be Homer Simpson's boss. What's uh, Mr. Smithers? Mr. Burns. <laughs> Mr. Burns, Mr. Burns, right, who, who hates everything. Uh, and you still wouldn't want to create a world like this in which you live. So here's where the faith piece begins to come in. You know, it's been under the surface and everything we've looked at. But why do we do what we do? Um, I'm sorry, but if you have the ability to not contribute to that, and for some people, either that isn't an option or it's a very small option. But I'll say for most of us in this room, we have the freedom to not contribute to that. And yet, if we do so, let's call it for what it is. That's sinful behavior. You know, and, and whatever your religious system, uh, it is off the mark of where we ought to be. And we shouldn't cut ourselves slack on that. So the question of why we do this is as profound as the question of saying, you know, why do I sin? With St. Paul, why do I do what I don't want to do? And here's where faith, I think, has a lot to begin to dialogue with. And I'm not going to say the devil made you do it. So. <laughs> but before we go there, in the same journal that the AAAS publishes, Science Magazine, it's one of the premier you know, world journals of science, in 1967, there was a famous article that stirred up a lot of uh, a lot of angst in the scientific community because a scientist by the name of Lynn White Jr. Uh, wrote an article and this was part of it. What people do about their ecology depends on what they think about themselves in relation to things around them. Human ecology is deeply conditioned by beliefs about our nature and destiny. That is by religion. I don't know if there's any practicing scientists here. If you tried to get this into Science Magazine today, Lots of luck. I don't know what the editors were smoking when they published this, but I'm glad it's there. Now, the article is not primarily about religion, but it's asking the very serious question, really, why do we do it? How did we get here? Right? And this was the 60s, so this was the, really the dawning awareness on a much larger public scale um, of the fact that the ecology was something we were having a big impact on. But you know, here you are, hardcore scientists, raising the question of saying, however we react with the system we are a part of, complex systems, that's conditioned by our beliefs about nature and our destiny. If your belief about nature is that there's an infinite source of fuel, you're going to behave in a certain way. If your belief in your destiny is that there's an infinite sink for your garbage, you're going to behave very differently than if you think, you know, if I dump my waste pail here, I'm going to have to walk through it tomorrow. Or my neighbor's going to, you know, walk through it tomorrow. And now you're setting up the grounds for conflict and racism and, pre you know, think about it. It all gets driven by something like, where do I put my waste? And for most of us in this room, you know, you probably don't give that a lot of thought. So I talked about the ecological hermeneutic. Is there a biblical hermeneutic? Uh, as I said, Laudato Si, uh, many of you I'm sure have read it. If you haven't, I just encourage you to get a hold of it. It's online, it's free. Um, but it's, it's the Pope's statement about how we interact you know, with our common home, as he says. And so early on in that document, or not so early on, but paragraph 65, he says, we can ask what the great biblical narratives say about the relationship of human beings with the world, okay? We can ask what the great biblical narratives say about our relationship with the world, okay? As Catholics, I, I'm not going to assume everybody here is Catholic. You can assume I am. But <laughs> when we talk, it's amazing how many imposters there are. The, 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 if you're get, looking to get married or something, don't just go online. Um, <laughs> But that being said, we do not read, and a lot of people misunderstand this. You know, the Catholic Church never says we read the book of Genesis in a literalist way or that you have to read it that way. You know, I'm a card-carrying astrophysicist. 
and I'm a card-carrying Catholic priest. I don't believe the universe was created in six 24-hour days. Um, I don't have to read it that way, but I see, you know, believing in standard cosmology is being supported by a lot of other things we know about the world. Well, the Catholic Church never said that is the way you have to read it, six 24-hour days. That's not the main thrust of what Genesis is about. That'd be a whole other talk. But what Genesis definitely is about is a brilliantly inspired insight to how we human beings interact with one another and interact with our God. And this is what Francis means when he says, what do the great biblical narratives say about the relationship of human beings with the world? So, the primal commission to till and to keep. So this is from Genesis 2. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. These two verbs, to till and to keep. You might read another translation, but the point is there are two different verbs in Hebrew. Okay? The power to till is limited by the responsibility to keep. Okay? I've got the power to till the garden. I have the, you know, you have stewardship over all, you know, over all the earth, but you also have to keep it, okay? Now that verb keep turns up again in pretty significant ways, so just hold on to that for a minute. But this is what God initially says. Notice, he gives them a job to till it, and he also limits them. You can eat from everything that's here, right? Dinner is served, you look out your window, but there's one limitation. You can't eat from this one tree. All right. The primal temptation. Resist all limits. Okay, so we could all recite this almost from memory. I'll just read it. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, here's the temptation. Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it or you shall die. Did Eve correct the snake exactly right? Eve added a little something. Let's look at what happened in the first temptation, right? This is the very first time. Imagine you were given the freedom to tempt a human being before anyone had ever been tempted before. I would give anything for that, as long as I could undo it. But wouldn't that be, isn't that just amazing? You, you've been tasked with tempting a person to commit the very first sin that's ever been made. So think of all the options that are open to the serpent, right? The most cunning animal God made. What is, this, what is the temptation? Did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? Like a laser beam, oh, I can even do it. Like a laser beam, he goes right after the only limitation that's been placed on man and woman. And he exaggerates it. He says, did God say you can't eat from any tree in the garden? What he's doing is he's exaggerating the limitation that God did give them. God gave them one very small limitation. And the serpent has tried to get Eve to think it's the ultimate limitation. Because if that were correct, God would basically be starving Adam and Eve. So Eve is a very smart woman. She says, no, that's not what God said. God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden. We only have one limitation, Mr. Serpent. We don't have this total limitation. But she adds something. Nor are we allowed to touch it or we will die. God never said anything about don't touch it. So what's happening here, you know, it's like you take a ball of mud, you throw it against the wall, most of it runs down, but a little bit sticks. And what's starting to stick in Eve's mind is that she now herself is starting to exaggerate the limitation on her freedom. Whoever wrote the book of Genesis under divine inspiration, I would give anything to meet that person. Because as a practicing priest and as a practicing sinner, okay, and, and all of us categorize ourselves as that, that, there's a lot of wisdom there. A lot of why I do what I don't want to do. It's because in the moment, I do want to do it, thank you very much. And a lot of it has to do with my fighting against limitations that have been placed on my freedom, and I don't like that. Okay? Serpent said to the woman, you will not die while well, we know the rest of the story. 
the primal fall. So if this was the temptation, the serpent is saying to Eve, resist all limits, you know? He's trying to keep you down. Resist those limits. Eat from the tree. If that's the temptation, the fall is that Eve denies the limit. She refuses to accept it. She refuses to accept that she shouldn't be able to eat from that one tree. And she crosses that boundary. Adam does the same thing. And now we're off to the races. But think about it for a minute. The primal temptation is a temptation to overstep an imposed limit. The primal sin is the overstepping of that limit. And God sits back and says, let it be, okay? He's not going to come down there and stop Eve's hand just before she gets to the fruit. So Adam and Eve refused to properly keep the Garden of Eden. God said, till it and keep it. Well, part of keeping it is the ecology of the Garden of Eden. It's allowing the structure of the garden to be the way the Creator wanted it to be. Okay? Cain refuses to be the keeper of his brother. Right? Famous line. After Cain kills Abel, God comes, hey, where's your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? It's the same verb in Hebrew. So Adam and Eve are meant to treat the Garden of Eden the same way Cain is meant to treat his brother. I'm the youngest of seven kids. I can't tell you how often I quoted this. <laughs> and they would say it was good enough for Cain, so it's good enough for us. Okay. The Israelites refused to keep the covenant with God. This is a verb you'll often see in the Hebrew scriptures. They did not keep the covenant. I gave a quotation here from Psalm 78. They did not keep God's covenant, but refused to walk according to his law. Remember Moses, they're out there in the desert, they're grumbling, they're angry at God. So the way the Israelites should embrace and hold on to that intimate relationship with the Lord is the same way Cain should embrace and take care of his environment, namely that little family of Adam, Eve, Cain, and Abel. And it's the same way Adam and Eve were meant to keep or take care of their oikos, you know, their environment. Um, so that same thread running through, how are we meant to relate to the world around us? What is the key insight of Laudato Si? There's lots of them, but these are the ones I want to mention. Integral ecology. Pope Francis doesn't invent the term, but he really elevates it. And I love the way that's phrased. Almost if we understood ecology well enough, we wouldn't even need the integral. But, you know, human nature being what it is, we tend to separate out ecology and we just imagine it only applies to this or that little fringe group. But integral. Everything comes under, you know, the purview of this I idea. It's not just, well, the life of animals or just the life of plants. Or, you know, when we talk about environmentalism, we're not talking about human beings. If you value the life of an unborn child, if you value the life of a senior citizen, you know, who's been neglected in a home, if you value your own life, you know, if you value the life of a tree, yes, of course, there's different levels of dignity there. But all of that life is interwoven. And so this idea of integral ecology is something Pope Francis drives home again and again. But my translation of that is the ecological hermeneutic and the biblical hermeneutic are one and the same. It's all about limits and relationships, okay? Remember the complex system we started with the cards waving? All about what's limiting the system and what are the relationships among the agents. What was limiting Adam and Eve? Don't eat from this tree. What was their relationship? Serpent to Eve, hey, have I got a fruit for you? You know, Eve to Adam, hey, have I got a fruit for you? That relationality. And then how is that, how are those agents relating vis-a-vis -vis the restrictions or the limitations on their system. Science and the Bible are entirely consonant here. I'm not saying the science proves the Bible or the Bible proves the science. You're never going to solve that one. You know, don't lose sleep over trying to absolutely prove using science that God exists. You know, you're not going to happen. It's not going to happen. Uh, and it certainly isn't going to convince a, a radical atheist. But don't lose sleep over the fact that you may upset a radical atheist. Instead, put your energy and your thought into appreciating the beautiful complementarity and the consonance that's there. Um, so the primal fault, denial of limits. In Laudato Si, here's a paragraph. 
Harm to both the natural and social environments <clears throat> are ultimately due to the same evil. This is Pope Francis writing. So harming the natural environment and the social environment, harming the seashore and harming the people who go to the seashore for their water or their clothing, cleaning their clothing, ultimately due to the same evil. The notion that there are no indisputable truths to guide our lives and hence human freedom is limitless. This idea that there is no limit to our freedom goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. I have an infinite source of fuel and I have an infinite garbage dump to throw the waste into. I believe I have limitless freedom. And he's saying that is the same evil that screws up nature and society. Here's another one, a couple of paragraphs down. Quote, if we approach nature and the environment no longer speaking the language of fraternity and beauty in our relationship with the world, okay, relationship. As soon as you talk about fraternity, there are limits. In a family, there are limitations. You are limited by where you come from. You are limited by your sibling relationship. Okay, if we approach nature no longer speaking the language of fraternity and beauty in our relationship to the world, our attitude will be that of masters, consumers, ruthless exploiters, unable to set limits on their immediate needs. Unable to set limits. If I can't appreciate fraternity amongst, you know, my fellow human beings, if I can't appreciate the fact that my carbon source is not truly infinite, I am unable to appreciate limits and necessarily going to wind up, you know, uh, going to be a ruthless competitor in my environment. So the lie of the unlimited. <clears throat> he uses the phrase technocratic. I'm just going to go on for a few more minutes, uh, then there'll be some discussion. The technocratic paradigm, and by that he simply means this idea that technology can ultimately manipulate you know, everything in the world around us, um, that we have the power to more or less orchestrate and make nature do our bidding. So that paradigm is based on the lie that there is an infinite supply of the Earth's goods. And this leads to the planet being squeezed dry beyond every limit. It is the false notion that an infinite quantity of energy and resources are available, that it is possible to renew them quickly, and that the negative effects of the exploitation of the natural order can be easily absorbed. Okay, what I want to highlight here though is again this idea of a limitless supply. Go back to why do we pollute the world around us? Ultimately it's tied to what do we fight against in our own limited lives? Show me a person who doesn't react well to the limitations that are placed on themselves, never mind global ecology, and I'll show you somebody who has the capacity to walk by you know, an ugly piece of trash um, because I'm not so plugged into the people in my life, the people around me. Complexity theory is grounded on the fact that it's nearest neighbor interactions that ultimately drive global behaviors. If you're not doing so good with your nearest neighbor, like your husband, your wife, your sibling, the person you work with, you know, whoever you're sitting around right now, right? Maybe they threw something on the floor. Are you going to do something about it? You know, I'm teasing. Um, what is it that we do? How is it that we interact with the people in our most immediate circle? And if we are the type that fight against, because if you say you have to be responsible for the need of another, again, never mind fighting pollution, how about just making yourself emotionally available? How about making yourself be generous with your time or your resources? If we choose not to do that, what we are basically doing is we're fighting against a perceived limitation. Because if I give you my time or my attention, that's less than I'm going to have you know, for myself or to put someplace else. It's a scarce resource. And I'm not saying that there aren't true limitations that have to be acknowledged at times. But the whole point of the talk here in Laudato Si and this whole idea of where do faith and science come together in the area of environmentalism means that the reasons why we allow a polluted world to exist and kind of turn a blind eye is that ultimately we're playing off of a limitation that would come about if we actually bothered to go out there and try and do something about what we see. And so science without technocracy, is it possible? Not how can I use science to control nature and dominate others, 
but rather how can the way that scientists think about the world help me think more fruitfully about God, the interrelatedness of humanity, and the limits which are inherent to humanity. If you're a good ecologist, the first thing you consider when you encounter a mystery or problem is what are the individual agents, how are they interacting with each other, what are the scarcity of resources that they have to deal with, and through those nearest neighbor interactions, what are the large-scale behaviors. You could take those things and translate them into the moral world with great fruitfulness. You know, you don't just have to throw up your hands and say, why do we have, you know, such ugliness in the world around us at times? What, you know, there's nothing we can do about it other than just rely on some good-hearted souls, you know, who are going to go out there and work in the nonprofits or whatever. No, no, look inside. You don't have to look very far to begin to say, how do I get at my own underlying attitudes? Um, and so the need for good science, how do we measure the intrinsic value of species? Pope Francis asked this. This requires a profound knowledge of ecological interconnection. How do we acquire a proper temporal perspective and not just short-sightedness, not just for me and my kids, but for generations to come? Well, again, good ecological science can help you answer those questions. How do we break out of the vicious circle of endless intervention in nature? Again, a good ecologist will tell you, if you poke here, you're going to get that effect over there. Don't pretend you just live in isolation. And simply that, you know, at the core of Christianity is certainly a Trinitarian reality. We don't just have a generic God, right? We have Father, Son, and Spirit. We have a Trinity. But a Trinitarian reality is a limited reality. Why do I, yes, God is all-powerful, I get that. What I mean is every authentic relationship in Trinitarian love is bounded by the other and by the love they share. The love for the Father and the Son, the Father, Son, and the Spirit, it's bounded by their relationship itself. That doesn't emasculate it. That doesn't make it impotent. Trinitarian love, reality, is a limited reality. Trinitarian circles are perfect, whereas self-centered circles tend to spiral into disorder. So a complex system is the Trinity itself. Um, and, you know, put that in your pipe and smoke it. Because uh, that's not a way we talk about the Trinity in the seminary, to be sure. Thanks. <laughs>